And uh, it's a section, a good section, and it goes until the end of John 17, uh, the last verse, 1726, and it's called the Upper Room Discourse. So you figure we're at the end of 13, you've got 14, 15, 16, 17, you've got a little over four chapters, and it's Jesus sharing his heart with the disciples because he's going to die on the cross the next day. He's going to be raised from the dead, and his plan is that the church would be born. And here we are 2,000 years later, so he is sharing things with his disciples that are for us today, and they are so important. And so it's called the Upper Room Discourse, and he's giving final instructions to the disciples and to us. So in verse 31, we're going to begin, we'll see with the words, so when he had gone out... And this points back to what had just happened in our story last week, that he is Judas Iscariot who betrayed the Lord. And last week in John 13, Judas had gone out. He left the upper room to go straight to the Jewish leadership and lead them back to arrest Jesus. So the events have now been set in motion. Judas left, and it's just the Lord in the upper room with the 11 disciples left. And those events are in motion. It's going to lead to Jesus' trial his beating, his scourging, and his crucifixion. And so because Judas has just gone out, Jesus is going to begin, we'll see in our first verse, by saying, now. He says, now. In other words, Judas is gone. Things are in motion. Now. And then he begins to share his heart. So let's read. We're, in, we're just going to look at eight verses today. There's so much there in these eight verses. It says... I want you to notice we're going to see five times this word glorify or glorified. So verse 31, so when he, that's Judas, had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. That was five times glory or glory, glorified Glorify, And so we're going to talk about God's glory this morning. Verse 33, Jesus says, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you. And we're going to see the word love four times. That you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this will all, will all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So we're going to talk about God's glory. We're going to talk about his love. The word love's there four times. One another's there three times. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. You know what? I don't have this in my notes, but I'm going to stop right now. I love that verse. That is a great memorial service verse when someone who knows the Lord passes away and goes to heaven, right? Isn't that beautiful? Let's read that again. Think of you knowing the Lord and Jesus, because it belongs to us, right? Peter says, where are you going? And Jesus says, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. I love that. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Notice in verse 37, Peter says, I will. And then he says, I'll die for you. I will for your sake. And Jesus says, will you for my sake? So we're going to talk about God's glory. We're going to talk about God's love. But we're also going to talk about his evaluation. You see, you and I have an evaluation of how we see ourselves. No one else can see that but us. But who we consider ourselves to be as a person, our walk with the Lord. We have an evaluation of ourselves. Peter had his evaluation of himself. And Jesus had his evaluation of Peter. And of course, what we want is the Lord's evaluation of you and I to be our evaluation of ourselves, right? And that's not always the case. Hello, that's not always the case at all. Hey, I will, I, you know, hey, and the Lord shows us our heart. So we're going to look at these things. 
So let's look at verse 31 and 32 where we see glorify five times. So when he had gone out, Judas, verse 31, Jesus said, now the son of man, he's talking about himself, that's Jesus, is glorified. Well, Lord, I thought you're going to, you said you're going to die on the cross. He's not, he is, but look at how he calls it. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Why doesn't Jesus notice just simply say, now I'm going to die? Now I'm going to die. He doesn't say that. He says, now the Son of Man is glorified. So he's not just telling the disciples and us what's about to happen. He's helping us see the importance and the significance of it. And what he's saying is that his crucifixion is going to bring glory to both the Father and himself. That's what he's simply saying. Okay, that word glorified, what does it mean? It means to give Let's, let's say this first without applying it to the Lord. It's to give anyone importance. It means to magnify or increase the estimation in which one is held. But of course, the one who's supposed to receive all the glory is our Lord Jesus Christ. I think a word I relate to and you do better than glory is credit. Who gets the credit for what happens, right? And it's the Lord. Is supposed to get all of it. He's supposed to get the credit. And who we see him to, to be should be magnified and should be growing and increasing in our mind and in our heart. John the Baptist said about Jesus, he must increase and I must decrease. And I stop there and go back to what we just talked about. And I think of Peter's estimation of himself and Jesus' estimation of Peter. And they were completely at opposite ends and different. And uh, so, glorify. It is God's revelation in which he manifests or shows us all the goodness that he is. So, since Jesus made all this goodness that God is manifest, he's, he's said to glorify the Father, or the Father is glorified in him. And this is seen at the cross. Wait a minute. This brutal, humiliating, torturous death and you're saying that is glorifying God, that is revealing all of his goodness. Well, you and I know that to be true. See, it doesn't make sense unless you know the Lord. When Jesus is said to be glorified, it simply means that his nature, his innate glory is brought to light or seen or made manifest and it's seen at the cross. From our side here, from the human perspective, his death on the cross, that looks like shame. It looks like he's being defeated. Unspeakable suffering and humil humiliation. But through God's word, we're seeing from God's side, from the divine perspective, it was the revelation of the glory of God, of all the goodness that he is. So picture Jesus suffering on the cross. If you see that movie, The Passion of the Christ. It's a really radical and difficult movie to watch, but we got to remember as we watch that movie, multiply that untold times to actually see it and be there. And um, that movie's tame compared to what our Lord actually went through that day. And so you're saying that brutality, you're saying God is glory, is glorified and you're glorified? Yes, that's what God is telling us, see, from his perspective. And that's what we're learning, and we'll see that right now. If you'll turn, please hold your place there. If you'll go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Genesis, the very first book, and then you turn to the second book after that, or the one right after that is Exodus. If you'll go to chapter 33 in Exodus, verse 18, we're going to look at Moses, and we're going to see God and Moses We're going to look at when God revealed his glory to Moses. And when he does this in our story, God reveals not just his dramatic splendor, but his character. So in other words, you guys, the Shekinah glory of God, the cloud, right, that they would see. And God's glory, the brilliance, the splendor, right? Like, oh my gosh, how beautiful. That's part of the glory of God. But when the, the scriptures speak of the glory of God... It isn't just that dramatic splendor that we can see with the eye. It's also speaking of the glory of God is what? His character. 
And so there in Exodus 33, Moses has led Israel out of Egypt. And it says in verse 18, and he, Moses, said to the Lord, please show me, notice, your glory. Then he, God, said, I will make my glory. No, look at I will make all my goodness, my character, see, pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord. The name always stood for the complete character of someone. I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious. There's God's character to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion. That's his love on whom I will have compassion. But he said, God speaking in verse 20, you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by in other words, when my splendor, the outward brilliance, and my character passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Well, let's keep reading and go into chapter 34. And the Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you. And let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. In other words, everyone stay away but you. So verse 4, he, Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in the cloud. Okay, wait a minute. There's that word now. Remember what Jesus said? Judas just went out to betray him. He's now on his way to the cross and he says, now will the Son of Man be glorified through the cross. Verse 5 here, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and notice, proclaimed the name of the Lord. The name stands for the total character. So God's going to speak. It isn't just that he sees the brilliance and the glory of God with his physical eyes. He is, but remember, he's only seen part. But remember, the glory of God includes his character. That's what we need to learn today, and that's what I learned this week that I did not know before. And in verse 6, and the Lord passed before him with that brilliance, that outward beauty, and notice and proclaimed, he's speaking in, about himself, and he says, the Lord, the Lord God, now here's his character, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth. And I want to stop right there because abounding in goodness, truth can also be translated full of grace and truth. Verse 7, God's still speaking about himself, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children children's children to the third and fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worship. Don't let that throw you in verse seven when God says about himself, by no means clearing the guilty. You know what God's saying? He doesn't wink at sin. There has to be a punishment. There has to be a just punishment for sin. By no means clearing the guilty. God cannot just say because he's just, perfectly just. He can't just say, oh, that's okay. Come on into heaven anyway. Yeah, I'm loving. That isn't love. He's perfect love, but he's perfect justice. Perfect justice. A price has to be paid. A punishment has to be given. That's what he's talking about. By no means clearing the guilty. But remember, we're going to go back and don't go back there yet. But we're going to go back in a few minutes to our story. And it's going to be what? Jesus at the cross. What? Paying that price for our sins and being glorified, showing his love, his character. That's the idea. Now, if you'll turn now, hold your place there and jump down to verse 28 and then hold your place at verse 28. Same chapter, Exodus 34, verse 28. 
And while you do that, I'm going to read to you. We started in John chapter 1, uh, the book we're studying today. And it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, talking about Jesus, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. And listen to what it says, full of grace and truth. Now, what we had just read in Exodus 34, 6, God speaking about himself said that he is abounding in goodness and truth. And it could be translated full of grace and truth. In John 1, it talks about Jesus. And John says, we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. It's the same. Now, Jesus dying on the cross, you know what that did? It proclaimed, right? Him to be what? His character. He's a holy God. He can't just pass over sin and wink at it. But he's also a loving God who did not desire the death of you and I, the sinner. And so it proclaims how he could be a just God and justify the sinner, you and I, by what? Dying himself on the cross for our sins. The idea is that every attribute of God, his character was supremely magnified on the cross at Calvary. The greatest moment, when was it, of God's displayed glory? God's glory. What was the greatest moment of his displayed glory? According to him, from his perspective. Was it when they saw the cloud of, of his glory and the Shekinah glory in the wilderness? No. God is saying in his word that the greatest moment of my glory was in the shame of the cross. There's no place we can look to better understand who God is than the cross. Because his glory is what? His character. Is there a better place we can look than the cross to know his character and his love? You see how the cross glorifies him? This is the meaning. This is what Jesus is saying. See, I don't get that. It's like, Lord, how can you say you're going to die a brutal death? Now I'm going to be glorified and God's going to be glorified. Because you're going to see and the world's going to see. Even disciples, if you don't understand this night, you will in the days to come. Oh my gosh. Look at his love. Look at his love. And he's lifted up more and more and more. He's glorified. Look at his character. That's the idea. There's no place we can look and more clearly recognize that he's worthy of all honor and glory than the cross. It's the highest moment, the cross of God's revelation to mankind. And in the cross, we learn more about God's excellence than in any other moment in history. In his death, we see God's holiness his love, his righteousness, mercy, his justice and grace, his sovereignty, he's in control, his humility, and we see his wisdom and his patience. And there's more, but basically in the cross, you're seeing who God is. That's the God we worship. That's the God we worship. Well, now let's look. You're there at Exodus 34. Before we turn back, do you know... He's going to come down the mountain after seeing God's glory. And the people are going to see some of God's glory upon him. So verse 28, so he, Moses, was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai. And the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain. Isn't this beautiful? That Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So he's in the presence of God and he's only seen part of God's glory. And he's seen that visible glory, that brilliance of God's light. But he's also seen God's character and he doesn't realize why he's while he's there, his face is beginning to shine. But who's making his face shine and where is that coming from? It's from the glory of God. As we go back to John, stop in the middle of your Bible in the Old Testament. Go to the book of Psalms, Psalm 90. And let's look at a, a, a psalm that Moses actually wrote, Psalm 90, verse 1. And we're not going to read the whole thing. We're going to look at four verses and we're going to kind of skip. But if you'll go to Psalm 90, verse 1. In verse 1, my Bible says, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. He says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. 
Let's jump to verse 12 now. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In other words, life is very short. Take a jump down to verse 16 now. Look how beautiful this is. Moses is praying. Let your work, Lord, appear to your servants and what? Your glory to their children. Stop right there. His glory is what? His character. His glory is all the goodness that you are, Lord. And it says your glory. Let your work appear to your servants and let your glory appear to their children. In other words, may they see, Lord, who you are in all of your goodness, in all of your character, right? Through their parents and through the, the believers. One more verse, verse 17. Think of Moses and his face coming down, shining from being in the presence of God. In verse 17, and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. A.W. Tozer, man of God in heaven now, said this was the most beautiful verse to him in the whole Bible. Verse 17, and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Let his beauty be upon us. And so picture that. <clears throat> Moses comes down from the mountain and, and the people get afraid because his face is shining, it's glowing, and he doesn't know it with the glory of God. May that be so in your life and mine. Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, lives within us. So his glory is there. Everyone, every part of him, every character aspect of him lives in his presence inside you and I. There is such great potential, and I think the Lord really wants us to realize that this morning. There is such incredible potential in your life and mine. And I was just thinking while we were worshiping, we've said it before, the words of this book are alive and powerful. This is dynamite in your hands. The Holy Spirit, if you give your heart to the Lord, God himself who lives in you and I, he's like fire. What happens when you touch fire to dynamite, okay? There's incredible power, dunamis power. That word, that's where we get dynamite from, dunamis. And the Lord said, after he died and rose from the dead, go and wait in Jerusalem. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He will come and fill you and live inside of you. And you will have power to be my witnesses. But remember, we're talking today about his love. You know, we're going to get there in a moment. They don't need to see our face glowing. They need to see the glory of the Lord, of the one who lives within us, as we allow him to change us and transform us from the inside out. They need his love, not our love. We don't have it without him. He's the one who lives in us and he does the loving through us. It's actually him loving them through us if we'll let them, but we, if we let him, but we stop him, right? We stop him. The only one who can keep God from having his way in you and I is you and I. Years ago, sitting at a light, going by, looked over at a bus bench, and, you know, they do advertising on bus benches. Smokey the Bear, we all know who he is. There was Smokey the Bear, and there was this saying, and you guys already know it. Only you, what, can prevent wildfires. Only you can prevent wildfires. And I thought, oh my gosh, so the Holy Spirit is like a fire. John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. That fire... That change in us and you and I, the, the fire touching the dynamite, his love coming forth in power. Don't you want power? Yeah, man, I'd love to have power to lay my hands on people and heal them, to do miracles, right? No, no, I don't want that power. I'd love to see God do those kinds of things. The problem is that if he gave any of us that power, all of a sudden you'd be in so much attention with the news and everybody like that your life would change it wouldn't be the same and anyway no 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 you know the power you and i want you know the power i want and we have it wait a minute you have it 
Is God living inside of you? Are you saved? If you are saved, God himself has come. The glory, the one who is the glory, lives in us. And we have the power, potential power inside. And what we want the power for is to love the way he loves. To love, oh, we know how to love Oh, you're nice to me today. I'm going to be nice to you. What if you're not nice to me? What if it's difficult? What if I'm not nice to you? Right? What about the, the people out on the road? What about everywhere we go this week? I find myself weak, unable in myself. How about you? Oh, I can love those that love me. So can you. How about his love? See, it's a supernatural love. But it lives in you and I. Do you want to let it run wild? Only you can prevent wildfires. Oh my gosh, what would happen if we, you know, we can have as much of God as we want. Think about that. We can have as much of Him as we want. How much do we want? Moses could only see part of God's glory. The ultimate expression of God's glory the ultimate expression of his grace and truth would come when Jesus, the word, was made flesh and he died on the cross. God's whole heart was revealed on the cross for the world to see. You remember, um, well, let's turn back and I'll tell you this as we do. If you go back to John 13, 32, and we'll pick up the study. And when we were back in chapter 2, so that's John 13, 32. The first miracle Jesus did, if you remember, in Cana was he changed the water into wine. And the disciples were just beginning to follow him. And it says in John 2.11, this beginning of signs or miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. In other words, just like Moses only saw part of God's glory, they saw him change water into wine. There's a glimpse of his glory. But on the cross, it's fully revealed his heart. Now, God's ultimate act of love, ultimate expression of his heart for people, for you and I, on the cross. Jesus revealed on the cross the same side of God's character that was emphasized to Moses when God said, I'm going to show you part of my glory. It's his love. Well, verse 32 Jesus said, if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him, notice the word, immediately. And what Jesus is simply talking about is that the next day he's going to die on the cross and three days later he's going to rise from the dead. This is all in motion and happening now. And he says, and glorify him immediately. In other words, this glorification is taking place starting now as I'm talking to you. The, it's in motion. Judas is gone to betray me. In verse 33, the only time we see in John's gospel, Jesus referred to them as little children, and that's for believers. Now remember, Judas is left, right? And Judas is not a believer. And so, by the way, I drove by, uh, it drove me crazy because I drove by a Christian high school years ago where we used to live. And you know, and they have the sign out front and every week they change it. You put something different there. And it said, we are all children of God. Is that true? No. We're all created by God. That's true. In the Bible, children of God are believers. If you want to read 1 John, go home and read 1 John. And he'll say, John will say, we're either children of God or we're children of the devil. We're either one of those. Before I was a child of God, I was a child of the devil, an unbeliever. So to say we are all God's children, no, we're not. You need to become God's child. You need to get saved. That's the idea. This is the only time he calls them little children. If you read 1 John nine times, uh, in 1 John, the same apostle who wrote this gospel will call us as believers little children. Now here we go, you guys, verse 34. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Well, the word new here, he says a new command, 
command, commandment I give you doesn't mean that it's new in time. In the Old Testament, they were commanded to love God and love their neighbor, right? In Deuteronomy, love the Lord with all your heart. In Leviticus 19, love your neighbor. So that when the scribe comes to the Lord, Jesus, in Mark chapter 12, and he says, what's the greatest commandment in the law, right? Jesus answers him and says, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater command, no other commandment greater than these. So Jesus said, I'm giving you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Just to love God and to love people, that's an old commandment. There's nothing new about that, you see. But he said, this is a new commandment, right? Now, Jesus had just demonstrated his kind of love. He got down on his knees and he washed their feet, humbly washed their feet. And now he's commanding from you and I and from his disciples that night, his kind of love, this kind of love, their love for each other was to make them servants of one another. And by the way, do you remember before this night, he said in Matthew 5, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. He went on to say, for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And when he says perfect, he's talking about Love everyone. That's simply what he's saying there. Mature, perfect. My Father in heaven. It's, a, it's like saying, therefore you shall love just as your Father in heaven loves. It's natural. Your neighbors, your co-workers, all love their family. Love their friends, right? Love those who love them. We all do that. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Okay, wow, that's now what's new. It's supernatural, you see, to love our enemies. We can't do that. No power to do that. By the way, God's love keeps on coming. God's love says this. That love's in you and I. That means you and I would say this him speaking through us, him having his way in my heart and yours, we would say, I'll love you no matter what. You can't stop me from loving you. If it's he himself in us, loving through us with his supernatural love, I'll love you no matter what. God's love keeps on coming. Who are you thinking about right now in your mind? Is there unforgiveness in my heart and yours? Is there a problem between you and I and anyone else? Unbelievers? How about believers? Any conflict or problem? The Lord said, listen, all men will know you're mine because you love them. No. Yes, they will. But no, no, no. He says just one thing. Just think of Christians. The whole world will know you belong to me because you love one another. Well, then it'll overflow out to them and you'll love them too. But what they're looking at first is look at that group of people in the church and how they love one another with his love. Oh, you're nice to me? I'm nice to you. Right? Not like that. No. His love. Love your enemies. A love that says, I'm going to keep on loving you no matter what and I'm not going to stop. That would be then a love that forgives. If it's his love, it's a love that forgives. Amen. Do you know what? Dynamite. Holy Spirit inside. Sit down this week. Open it up. Open up the dynamite. Sit alone with God. Just you and Him. 
the Holy Spirit. And he wants to light a match to boom, just bring power in your life and mine because he wants to fill us with his Holy Spirit and his love, which is the fruit of the Spirit, loving his way. But there's one, two, three, four. How many people in my mind, in my heart that I have not forgiven or that have hurt me? And I wonder, why is there no explosion? Why is there no power? Where is his love? And you know what, guys? Is there someone you have not forgiven yet? You, you can't. It's impossible. Because your love and mine will only love those who love us in return. We have to let him do that work in us of his supernatural called agape love. What's new about this commandment of Jesus to love one another is the measure of the love. He says, as, as I have loved you, his love is altogether unselfish, even unto death. He loved to the point of sacrificing his life. His agape love is defined by the cross. The old saying said, love your neighbor. The new one, he's saying, love your enemies. Oh, wait, you know, love your enemies. Um, higher standard of love based on the example of Jesus, our Lord himself. It's new also because he's the source of that love, and it's only possible because what we're talking about, he's being glorified on the cross where we see his character, his love. If he hadn't paid for our sins and then given us his nature, a new nature inside, we would be unable to love one another this way. But this commandment is also new because the church is born and he sent the Holy Spirit. And when we get saved, he comes to live within us and he is the power himself. So I'm falling, <laughs> fall short. I'm falling far short. I'm convicted as I read the word and I'm realizing I'm thinking I'm loving, but all the loving I'm doing, <laughs> it seems to be in my own power and strength. And... Um, And you know the other thing sometimes? Just be straight. Sometimes our pride can love to be known as a loving person. And we love to hear that. We want people to think that, oh, well, that should be every one of us, right? His love in you and I, loving the world, everyone should know we're a loving person. But what it's supposed to look like is Moses who came down from the mountain and didn't realize that the glow was on his face, right? Didn't realize it. We're just in love with Jesus, and then everywhere you go, you don't have to say a word. They're going to know. Because his glory, his love, his character is going to come through. In verse 35, um, by the way, ouch, he says, husbands, Ephesians 5, 25, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That's our example. He says, love one another, a new commandment, as I have loved you. Husbands, love your wives as I love the church, and I died on the cross for her. Love her that way. That's my commandment to you. I can't do that. No, you can, but I live inside of you. Let's get together, you and I. Spend some time alone. Will you let me have your, my way in your life and your heart? If you do, I'll change you. I'll fill you with me. I'll take every part you give me. You can have as much of me as you want. Let us not limit the Lord. What does he want to do this year in the days ahead? ahead? And you guys, I know he wants to fill us with the Spirit and fill us with that love. And we are the only ones who limit that. Just check yourself because I find myself in studying this, this week so much just loving in my own love, right? my own power, which doesn't go very far. This love is a love that can be commanded. He's speaking of a love that goes beyond emotional attachment, personal affection. It's a love of commitment. It seeks the ultimate good of the other person, even to the point of personal sacrifice, even to laying your life down for someone else. And then that, he's speaking about a continuous nature. In other words, keep on loving. It means constantly loving one another this way. It's his supernatural love. It's not dependent upon how you and I feel, what we're thinking, what we want upon someone else's reaction or upon our circumstances. 
Nothing can stop it. Do you know in the concentration camps in World War II during the Holocaust, there were people in there, and there was a man who was a prisoner, Viktor Frankl, and he said there, they took, the Nazis took everything from us, but there was one thing I learned that they could not take from us. It's inaccessible, and that is our ability to choose our attitude and the circumstances we were in. So we have the Son of God living in us, the Holy Spirit, and the potential to love our captors even, and those who might even torture us. And how do you stop that? You can't stop that. You can't. How do you stop the Apostle Paul? You beat him, you imprison him, you can't stop him. How do you stop him? You kill him, he says, to die is gain, right? And then God will take that death and multiply his word and bring more believers. The Bible teaches us that the love of Jesus, the essence of God's agape love is self-sacrifice, not self-centeredness. And he is our supreme example of that love. God's love, this new commandment, always expresses itself in unselfishness. It's totally opposite to your and my human self-centered way of loving. His love is unconditional, it's freeing, it's an other-centered love. It's not dependent upon our being loved in return. And, and uh, it just keeps on loving. It's supernatural. Our human love is based on our feelings, our circumstances, others' responses. Are you loving me back? Oh, okay, well, you know, right? It always depends, our love is conditional on three things. One, how are, what are you thinking today? How do you feel today? What are your desires? Number two, what's going on in your life? What are the circumstances? And three, how does that other person respond to us? You see, all those things are limiting me. I can't love them because, you know, I'm feeling this way today. I'm not feeling real good today. So I can't love that way. See, no, -uh, that's not what the Lord says. Well... Difficult things are happening in my life, so see, I can't love that way. It's not dependent on that. Well, they might not like me if I love them that way. God's love, it, it, it's just love. It has unconditional, nothing to do with anyone else. And then can you imagine the believers in the world today in the church, if we would love that way, what would happen? What you would have is dynamite and fire. <laughs> and you just, don't you want that? Why not? Okay, wait a minute. Let's go back 2,000 years. The only believers, the world's as big as it is right now. The only believers in the whole world. He just died and rose from the dead and we know it and we've given our hearts to him. And this is the only nation and this is the only city and this is the only building and every believer that exists in the world right now is in this room. And he says, go. Share my love and my word and make disciples of all nations. Can we do it? No. They did it. How did they do it? By the power of the Holy Spirit inside and through his love. By this will all men know you are mine. Your love for them, no, yes. Your love for one another. Man, Lord. Now, I love my wife because she loves me back, right? But I'm supposed to love her with God's unconditional agape love. But when you're dating someone, you're looking for that to come back, right? Well, I love you, right? And I love you because I want you to love me back. See, I'm, I want something in return. That's our human love. And basically at its core, all of our love, friendship, family, it's, it's a self-centered love because no matter how selfless it looks on the outside, we will always be loving that other person, hoping to get in return the love or the admiration we so desperately need and see God's love. Unconditional, no conditions need to be met and no matter what anybody does, I'm gonna keep on loving you because it's him and you and I loving them. How are you doing with that? I haven't been doing so good. But all we need is for him to put before us the truth in his word and then say and agree with him, my commandments are my enablements. And if you'll just step out and say, this is what you're saying, do it. Do it. Right? Wow. Lord, what are you going to do? C.S. Lewis said human love is always a need love. 
with self-centered motives, but God's love is always a gift of love with no strings attached. A.W. Tozer said, in, in your heart and mine, in every Christian's heart, there's a cross. You've got a cross in your heart. And there's a throne. And you and I, the Christian, are on the throne till he puts himself on the cross. If he refuses the cross, he remains on the throne. Don't raise your hand. Which one are we on? Are you on the cross in your heart? Or are you on the throne in your heart? You see, we cannot try. You know, I'm going to go out this week. And I'm just going to try harder to love, to be loving. I'm just going to try really hard. Well, that's not going to last very long, huh? That's not going to get us very far down the road. We can't. Instead, let's go to his feet. Spend time alone with him. With the word, the dynamite, and prayer. And just you and the Lord. And that's where it happens. And let him have you. <coughs> Jesus would say, come. Come often. Linger long with me. And I and you are the only ones who hinder this from happening. You see, his love, will it's like this, will always continue to flow in our hearts, right? We don't have to earn it. He just loves us, period. And his flow never stops. Think of his love. He's trying to pour his love into your heart and mine this morning. Like, like a mighty river, he's trying to pour it in, right? But our response, our will and our choices determine whether it gets through to us. He doesn't force his love on us. Holman Hunt, he was this artist, famous picture. He draw pictures of Jesus or paint pictures. He died in 1910. Well, in 1873, he painted a famous picture called The Shadow of Death. It's a picture, it's inside the carpenter's shop in Nazareth, and there's Jesus as a young man before he begins his ministry working in the carpenter's shop. And in the picture, he stops and takes a, a pause from his work, and he stretches himself like he's been working, and like, he stretches himself like this, right? And the sun is coming through the window and shining on him as he does that. And in the back on the wall, you see the casting of a shadow of the cross on the wall behind him. Isn't that cool? He painted that picture, and it shows Jesus while he's still alive, but he's stretching, and you see the shadow of the cross on the back. They need to see the glow on Moses' face from you and I, but not our face, his love coming forth. They need to see the cross on the shadow of our life because we die to ourself and let him live in us. That's what they need to see. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. The part of self we're to deny is our fallen self. Everything inside of us that's in, incompatible with Jesus and you guys, as we sit at his feet, he's faithful to show you and I those things and you and I that he wants to change. And he does that. Will we sit still and meet with him and let, it, let him do it? Denying ourselves is this. Okay, cross and throne. Which one are, are you and I on? On the cross or on the throne? Denying ourselves is denying our supposed right to go our own way. Who's on the throne? Denying ourselves is saying, Lord, you are the Lord. Have your way. You know, we need servants. He calls us all to serve in ministry, to serve other people, to wash each other's feet. He said, I've given you, given you an example and do it. But he would say, please come back to me. Come to me. Because first, it just begins what I want and desire my children is that you would come to me and love me and you would love me because you receive my love for you come and be with me and I will pour my love upon you and you will love me in return then go up from that place and I want to love everyone Wherever you go, I'll do the loving in you if you'll let me. And you'll have delight and joy knowing it's me, my power, my love. This has always been Christianity, the living God being glorified in us. And how is he glorified? 
When his character comes through, what's his character? My love, a new commandment I give you. It's the very essence of God's agape love to overflow. Now, unforgiveness in my heart and yours can quench that agape love from filling us and block it off in our hearts. We hold on to hurts, resentments, and bitterness. The greatest evidence of his agape love in our hearts is undeserved forgiveness. First, us receiving it from him, then in us forgiving others. His love keeps on coming no matter what. It's his love that brought our forgiveness. His love in our hearts will always lead us to forgive others, just as his love led God and Christ to forgive us. Lack of forgiveness in my heart exposes a hard and loveless heart. Lack of forgiveness in my heart reveals a lack of love. Only his love has the motive and the power, the desire to forgive and the power to forgive. So the extent of his love in you and I goes as far as our ability to forgive. Man, Lord, ouch, right? Wow. The depth of our love, his love in us, is shown by how much we forgive. Forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you, Ephesians says. To love one another as Jesus loved us, that the world might see, is with his love that forgives. <clears throat> now, listen carefully, please. Because there's misunderstanding in this room right now that the Lord wants to, like, remove right now. Two practical ways that we as Christians, not anybody out there, loving each other first, right? First, by willing, being, being willing to apologize and seek forgiveness from those we have wronged. Am I willing and are you willing to go and ask forgiveness? Second, number two, by willing to give and grant forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Well, you hurt me. You need to come to me. I'm waiting. You need to come to me, right? Listen carefully. I'm going to share three scriptures with you. This is the heart of the Lord. <clears throat> In Mark 11, Jesus tells you and I to forget everyone of everything. So here's what it looks like. We're going to go home this week. We're going to get alone with him. <clears throat> And really do business with him and let him love us and we're going to love him in return. And that's going to mean he's going to have in our, his way in our heart. And as we're in that private place, we're going to pray. And Jesus says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your father in heaven may also forgive you. But if you do not forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Does that mean if I've got someone in my heart that I'm refusing to forgive? That all of my sins are back on me and I'm going to hell? No. What it means is, doesn't sin separate us from God? When I sin, my communion, not my relationship, I'm saved, but my communion with him is broken. Well, God says, if you refuse to forgive, then I will not forgive you and you'll know it. And what he's saying is unforgiveness is a sin. So now I'm sitting at his feet and I'm with him. And I want that love to just flow, and it's not. And it's like, what's wrong, Lord? And he says, oh, I want it to flow. You're refusing to forgive this person. So he says, when we're alone, to forgive everyone of everything. Now listen, who goes to who? Do I go to you or do you go to me, right? Well, listen, both. Matthew 5, speaking about when you have wronged or I have wronged someone else. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, in other words, I hurt him, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So now what I've done is I'm alone with him and I'm forgiving everyone of everything and I realize he says, my brother has something against me, I hurt him get up and go to him. So I get up and I leave and I'm on my way to him. Well, now you're the one I hurt. 
And Jesus is now speaking about when you've been the one hurt or wronged. He says, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So now you and I have been the one hurt. We're alone with him. He says, forgive everyone of everything. But if they wronged you, get up and go to him and talk to him about it. Okay, I need to go do that. So what you have is this guy lives over here and this guy lives over here. And they're brothers in the Lord and they go to the same church, right? And one of them is wronged the other. This guy definitely did the offense. And this guy's definitely hurt. They both know it, right? And they've both been alone with the Lord. And he says, when you pray to me, forgive everyone of everything. Go to him. If you're the one who sinned, go to him. Here I go. And here you are. If he sinned against you, go to him. And here you come. And it, isn't it a beautiful picture? I picture like a hill, two houses. They're both coming. As they come up over the brow of the hill. Isn't that beautiful? In its perfection, that's what it's looking like. You go, you go. In other words, the Lord's like saying, if we take his word, he's saying, the world needs to know me. They need to be saved. The way they're going to do that is you allowing me to have my way in your life and letting me fill you with myself and my supernatural agape love. And I will do the loving through you. That love for you on the cross is unconditional and forgives everything. I in you will give you the power to forgive everyone of everything. Get up and go. Get up and go. In other words, you can see, Lord, you have no toleration or no out for unforgiveness to reside in your church and in your children and in your body. Imagine if every bit of unforgiveness in this room and my heart and yours was suddenly given to Jesus and with his power, we forgave and we went and took care of whatever we needed to take care of. The world would see what? <laughs> they'd see dynamite and they'd see the Holy Spirit fire and they'd see power to love and they'd go, wow, man, those people. Jesus is there in that church. They love with his love each other. And that love overflows. And you guys, we go out from here and everywhere you go, you, you're loving people. And they can't stop you. So challenge yourself. Can they stop us? Oh, you treated me bad. You cut me off in my lane. You yelled at me. You spit at me. You hit me. You stole from me. Right? You see how powerful it is when we keep loving that person and we can only do it with his love? This is Christianity. This is what the master is saying. This is what his word says. So. Don't have a lot of time to get into it. Peter said, what? Lord, I'm ready to die with you. And the Lord said, you'll deny me three times this night. If I look at Luke's account of that, I'll share it with you. Peter says, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. There's his self-evaluation. Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times. There's Jesus' evaluation. Three words. Peter says, I am ready. Jesus says, you will deny. I am ready. You will deny. And that's you and I. You guys, I'm ready. Let's go love this way. You will deny I'm going to try harder. No, you need to come to me, right? Get alone with me. Spend time with me. And let me be your strength. So, here's the dam. Here's the water on the other side of the dam. The wall of the dam will not let the water through. That is your stubborn self-will and mine. 
But crack that dam and what happens in power that flows forth. Are you telling me this morning as we close that his love is coming to my heart in an unending way, in such abundance and power, his love for me, that it's like that dam and he's trying to break through to me and I'm keeping him from doing that. And the only one keeping me from that overwhelming knowledge of his love for me is me and the answer is yes so let's get alone with him and let him crack that dam and have his way and he said out of your heart will flow rivers of living water and this he spoke concerning the holy spirit whom those who would believe in him would receive and the fruit of that person the holy spirit living in you and i is that love that keeps on loving so I fail all the time, so do you. Okay, man, I share this with people all the time. You guys, I fail, I fail, I fail. I'm like Peter, I can do it. I'm ready, and then I fail, and I learn how weak I am, and I need him. How about you? But we go out to the little guys who fall down running the bases, who just got hurt, and what do we do? We go out, we go out and we brush them off, and we say what? Shake it off. Get up and go shake it off. Let's start today. You know, the whole thing comes down to we are so attracted and drawn to God, to this person who is perfect love, who loved us enough to die on the cross for us. And you can't be good enough to earn heaven. So I'm going to share a prayer right now. And right now inside, you're either holding on to, you think you're going to go to heaven because you're pretty good and you're going to make it there. Well, you're going to go to hell and you're not going to go to heaven because any sin, one sin, will separate us from him forever. That's how evil it is. So he said there has to be a price paid and the only thing I'll receive is innocent blood shed. Well, I can't die for you and you can't die for me because we're sinners. Well, now we got a problem in his justice, in his character, in his glory. It glorifies him. We will be separated from him forever, but he's perfect love. So he says, I'll become a man and live among you and live a perfect life and my sinless blood will be shed for you and I will receive that payment for your sins. All you need to do is believe in me and receive that. Have you done that? I'm gonna ask Larry to um, turn the lights down now. I'm gonna ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. 